Thank you. So, um, I loved the show Mythbusters. Who else here used to enjoy that show? And I think that it's because I am a bit of an information addict. Like, I love to learn things. I love to know new things. Um, and I love the fact that they would constantly look at so many different things and find out if it was sort of fact or fiction, myth or reality. Um, and I want to try to take the same kind of approach to learning a little bit about security here today. Um, the first thing that I want to look at is security is scary, right? It's it's big and it's complex and there, we know that it's important and so like that makes it even a little bit more scary, but we know that we need to understand it. We need to know a little bit about it. Um, but as we're trying to plod along and find our way, we inevitably, uh, you know, we start learning some of the basics, the little things, and then we do a Google search, probably one that we maybe shouldn't have done, and the next thing you know, we freak out. <laughs> Right? Who has done a security search like that? Yes. Um, it just, you're like, this is, this is too much. I can't handle it. But the truth is, security doesn't have to be scary. This is me. I'm Aaron Campbell. I lead the WordPress security team. And this is also Aragon. Aragon was a family pet for about 10 years. Same kind of lizard that was in that video that scared the snot out of that cat. Um, but not scary at all. As a matter of fact, she was super docile, extremely friendly, and um, vegetarian. So that cat really didn't have anything to worry about. Um, but. I didn't get to know Aragon um, when she was an 18-inch lizard like you see here. When we first got her, she was tiny. She was about three inches long. Um, I didn't see these spikes on her as looking big and scary because when she was little, they were soft. And as a matter of fact, they, they stay soft. They look scary, but they're not. And it's because I learned as, uh, you know, sort of as she grew and it wasn't scary at all. So I think that, it, that we can take the same kind of approach to learning security. We can learn some of the basics, we can build a foundation of knowledge, and then be able to move forward with that. And as we learn the, the bigger, more complex things in the future, we have something to sort of reference back to, to build safely upon. But there's so much information out there about security that it can be really hard to do that. Uh, there's, there's an overwhelming amount of information and some of it directly conflicts with other things because there's a lot of incorrect information about security out there. So I want to look at some of the big ones that we hear all the time, talk about whether they are actually helpful for securing their site or if they only make you feel more secure but don't actually do any good. Um, and, and use that as a basis to build forward. So the first thing, the first um, sort of thing that I want to address and look at is updating. Everyone talks about updating and how important this is for security. Update, 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 update WordPress and update all the plugins and update the themes. And um, you know, if you're running your own hosting, update all the things on your host as well. Um, is this actually important? Is this a thing that actually makes your site more secure? Absolutely. Um, this is one of the easy ones. That's why I wanted to start with it. Um, the, the difficulty with this that I always, uh, the, the struggle with learning about this, I guess, is that I hear so many people say, but do I re should I really run the latest version? Isn't that... Um, you know, have more bugs or possibly even more security flaws? Do I really want to update to 4.9 next month when it comes out, or should I wait for 4.9.1, the next version? Wouldn't that be more secure? Um, and I want to say that as far as WordPress and our security, there is no reason to not update if, if you're doing it for security reasons, if you're worried that the next version won't be as secure as the one that you're on. Every single vulnerability that we patch in WordPress, that we patch for the current version, 4.8, that you're running now, is also patched at the same time for the next version that's coming down the pipe. 
So that version is always going to be the most secure version of WordPress. Um, if you want to hold back a version because you still have clients to train on the new stuff, that's okay as long as you don't fall very far behind. A version behind is fine as, and you're on the latest release for that version. So don't be on 4.8.1 right now because 4.8.2 is the secure one. Um, and when it comes to WordPress specifically, this is probably the strongest tool in your toolbox for keeping your site secure. It is absolutely that important. And as we talk uh, a little bit later about the kinds of attacks that are most prevalent on the web, um, staying up to date will block a huge number of those. Which brings me to the next thing that I hear a lot of people talk about, which is I don't need to worry as much about security because I'm only running a cat blog um, or whatever it is. No one is going to try to hack my site because even if they succeed, uh, what would they get out of it? Um, because when we all think about attacks on the web and about sites being compromised, we picture these really targeted attacks, people sitting down and specifically looking at a website and saying, I'm going to break into this and get something out of it. We think that they're maybe um, motivated by getting credit card numbers or stealing identities or maybe it's politically motivated or whatever it is. Um, but the truth is, those kinds of attacks only account for a small fraction of a percent of the overall attacks on the web. The vast majority are scripted attacks. They're automatically um, run. And so the truth is, this one is absolutely busted. If you've had a website on the internet for more than about five minutes, it has been attacked. Um, hopefully with no success, but it has been attacked. Um, and there are a lot of these scripts that are out there that just crawl the web and look for known vulnerabilities, things that they can easily uh, exploit. The most common is out-of-date software because if you're running an old version of WordPress that there was a vulnerability in, they know about it now and they've programmed their script to use that to break into your site. And they don't need a lot out of your site. Uh, they will put ads up or something and that is actually quite profitable at scale. Um, and that is unfortunate but true. Um, so staying up to date will help the most with this, but the truth is, unfortunately, every one of you, your site is going to be attacked. The good news is that these are automated scripts that are doing so, so we can learn from them and stay one step ahead of them, and if we do, if we can stay one step ahead of, of these automated attacks, which if you follow the rest of these slides, we'll be able to, we'll be able to prevent more than 99% of all attacks. And that is extremely effective. Um, another one that I hear people talking about it a lot is locking down files, right? The way, that, the way this one goes is um, you make all your files for your website not writable. They, uh, even, the, uh, even WordPress can't modify the files. Um, and the idea is if someone does break in, then if they try to leave a back door, write some sort of file so that they can get back in later, they won't be able to. The files will be locked down. They won't be able to write to them. Sounds good, right? Is this actually useful for security? No, it's not. I saw some of you shake your heads no, which I actually really appreciate. Um, and here's why. First of all, I think that this is putting the security at the wrong place. It's a little bit like putting a big security door between your living room and kitchen so that if someone breaks into your house, they can't steal the china. It's like, don't we want to actually keep them outside the house instead? Um, it seems like a much better idea, completely keep them out. But what does it hurt, right? If, if someone does break in, isn't it better to keep them away from the China than, than let them at it? The problem comes back to updating. And as the lead of the security team, uh, our team, one of our 
best tools for helping protect all your sites is being able to force update those sites and patch them against security vulnerabilities when we find them. So when I pushed out WordPress 4.8.2, which hopefully all of you are running, um, that was able to not just be released and wait for people to update it, that was able to be actively pushed out and start protecting sites all over the internet. I got to get in our little dashboard and watch tens of thousands of sites a minute be updated and secured because they allowed WordPress to modify the files and protect their site. And so not only can this, uh, does the, do I think this puts the security at the wrong place, it actually prevents me and my team of professional security people uh, from helping you protect your site. Um, and if we can update your site even while you're sleeping or on vacation or whatever else, we can protect it against a vulnerability that you maybe didn't even know existed. Um, avoid using the admin username. Now this, this one has two basic incarnations. Um, the, the one that you read the most, I think, is that you should never use the, the name admin for your admin user. Um, but in general, this comes down to you should keep your username private and secret. Because if I know your username to log into your site, then I am halfway to breaking into your account because you only have a username and a password. Is this helpful for security? Should you avoid using admin? Should you make sure that your username is not discoverable? No. Busted. <laughs> now, who here is on Twitter? Yeah. Now, I know your Twitter username just by looking at your tweets, right? Um, who here has Gmail? Of those of you that have Gmail, how many of you would be willing to give me your email address so I could send you an email? Yeah, I know your, e I know your username. See? Because your username is just a claim to who you are. It's like if I were to walk into a bank and say, I'm Aaron Campbell, I would like to pull some money out of Aaron Campbell's account. They say, show me some ID and prove it. And that's where the password comes in. The password is the secret thing that verifies that you are who you claimed to be. And the username is just the claim. It's your name. Um, and so keeping that secret and not discoverable really isn't that useful. And as a matter of fact, who knows that you can log into your WordPress site with your email address, which you probably freely give out to all these people at the conference. But that's OK. That's OK because the security comes from the password or possibly even two-factor authentication if you're running that. But that's where the security comes from. You don't need to, instead of stressing about trying to keep your username private, just make sure that you're using a good password and uh, go from there. Um, the next one that I want to talk about is changing your database prefix. Who has ever seen like the, the list of database tables that are in WordPress? Yeah, they're all named the same on every WordPress install, roughly. It's, it's something underscore users, something underscore posts. And usually, that's WP underscore users, WP underscore posts. But that WP underscore, that prefix, can be changed in your configuration file, your WP config file. And so the idea here is that if a user, if a hacker gets, gets into your server or uh, accesses it in some way, that you don't want them to be able to know what your users table is, because they might try to sneak in an extra admin user there. Um, and so you make that prefix something random, something they, they can't know, can't guess. Um, but does this make you more secure? No, no. no it does not. Busted. Um, this, is, this is similar to the, the username thing, um, or similar to the... Um, it's putting the security in the wrong place, similar to the one from two ago, which is that, yeah, which is that when you, uh, once they're in that far to be able to be querying your database, um, they can simply send a query asking for the list of tables. Or if they've gotten in through WordPress, they can use WordPress's own built-in functions for ac accessing those tables. Um, 
And so it's not particularly useful. And some of this, including the, the admin and the username and this prefix, it was historically more useful back when these scripts that went around the web trying to break into sites were much less sophisticated than they are today. Um, but no, none of the ones that are running around trying to break into sites today are, have hard-coded in table prefixes. They simply discover them. So if you want to change your table prefix for other reasons, go for it. If you're running multiple sites in the same database, if you are, um, I don't know, just prefer a certain naming convention, that's fine. But don't think that it's securing you because it's not. And when you think you're doing something to secure your site, but it's actually not helping, it's actually causing a problem because it's lulling you into a sense of security, making you feel like you've done enough when maybe you haven't. So instead, we can focus on the things that actually do help. What about hiding your admin, your login page, right? Putting it somewhere. Every WordPress site, if you go to that site, slash wp-login.php, boom, you get a login uh, you know, prompt. Or if you go to slash wp-admin and you're not logged in, you get redirected to that. Um, and a lot of people want to move that somewhere else so the hackers don't know where it is. That way, they can't break in. Does this help? No, it does not. Um, and again, this comes down some to the sophistication of, of the modern day scripts. But also, let me explain it like this. If, if you were to build a brand new house that you didn't want broken into, but it's on a nice street, and you've got a lawn and a little walkway coming up to your house and a, a porch and no front door, People still know, if they're trying to break into your house, that there's a door somewhere. You go in and out, right? <laughs> well, you log into your site, and they know that. And modern day scripts are extremely good at finding this, even if you move it. Um, and unlike some of the other things where I was like, you can do it if you want to, uh, but it doesn't help security, this one I really recommend against doing. And the reason is that it tends to break a lot more than it actually protects against. Um, a lot of times, moving this login, moving the admin, uh, tends to break other plugins, isn't compatible with a lot of things, causes a lot of issues and strange glitches. So I would just avoid this one at all costs. Um, SSL. There's been a lot of talk around this one with, uh, with the changes in Chrome and uh, you know, search engine rankings, although that's not a security issue, right? That's for getting better SEO. But is SSL useful for security? Is it important in securing your site? Yes, absolutely. And it's important for your e-commerce site and your business site and your parents' blog and everything. There is no reason that any site on the web should not have SSL now. It just, it just shouldn't happen. Um, what SSL protects you against is all kinds of things that you don't necessarily think about on a daily basis, which is everything that happens between your computer or any of your visitors to your website's computer and the server that hosts your website. Uh, that could be going through, you know, coffee house Wi-Fi that you don't know who controls. Uh, it goes through so many routers in between that you don't know who has access to or whether one of those has been compromised. And SSL makes sure that all the traffic sent from the computer to the server is encrypted. So if there is some weak point in the middle, they're not seeing your username and password flow by and going, ooh, that's nice, I'll keep that for later. Um, instead, it's encrypted, and they can't tell what it is. And because SSL has gotten so inexpensive, because so many hosts are offering it free, and if they're not, you can go through Let's Encrypt and get a free SSL cert, there is no reason for any site to not run SSL. And now, passwords, right? Passwords, I think that we all know, so I won't even wait for it, that passwords are important, right? <laughs> Passwords are clearly important, but they're so important that I actually want to talk a little bit about what makes a good password. The, the myth that we're looking at here isn't, 
are good passwords important? Uh, it's what, what things that we think make a good password actually make a good password. First, long passwords. Is a longer password a better password? Yes, all other things being equal, yes. Now, all things are not equal among all passwords, but generally speaking, longer is better. Um, password strength is measured in something called entropy, but the, the real way that this applies is roughly how many guesses is it going to take a password cracking tool to break your password. Um, and longer, generally means it will take more guesses. What about substitutions? We've all seen this, right? You trade out a letter in your password for a symbol or a number that sort of looks a little like it. Uh, this way, the idea is that you can use a word that you know, but it's not just that word, so it's not as easy to guess. Does this make your password a better password? That was a much more mixed response. Not especially. Um, the reason being that there are really only a handful of letters that are reasonably replaceable by symbols, and for each of those there's only a handful of symbols that you can replace them with, and every modern password cracking tool that I have seen automatically tries substitutions for all the words that it's doing. Um, it only increases the number of guesses by a very small amount, and it makes your password a lot harder to remember and type and everything else, but not that much harder to guess. And so that is not especially useful in making a good password. So what do we do? What about passphrases? This is my dog, King Air, um, and this picture was taken while I was sitting in my chair on a video conference call, and I was talking to my computer, and she clearly thought I should be talking to her instead. Um, and so for about a half hour phone call, she sat here staring at me just like this. <laughs> yeah. So passphrases are taking something that's memorable to you, like this experience, and making it into a password. Maybe my password would be King Air watches me on calls, right? Maybe creepily so, but it's true. And, um, and that's nice and long. That's 27 characters. We said that length is better. Are passphrases then a good way to do passwords? Does it make your password more secure to use something like a passphrase? Maybe. <laughs> so let's talk about this a little bit. Um, it's 27 characters, but it's only five words. And as I've talked about how these scripts have gotten more and more advanced, password cracking scripts have as well. They do dictionary attacks, which let them guess whole words rather than just characters. Um, and the struggle for this is that a lot of times they will go to a site like mine, AaronDCampbell.com, and they'll immediately scan it and see that there's some Twitter links. So then they'll pull in words from my Twitter feed, from my website, and all these things, and they will build a custom dictionary that they use to try to break my password. So the only word in that password that might be unique is my dog's name, King Air, but that's in my Twitter feed or possibly in a post on my site, and so that's part of the dictionary, and now instead of needing to break 27 characters, it's only five words. So it's better than just say, making my password just King Air, <laughs> but it's not necessarily good. It's improving, we're, we're making progress, but it's still not the best method. So what is the best method for building a good password? Yes, random. Password manager is the only good way to do this. Um, who here is using a password manager? That's fantastic. I love that as I've given talks similar to this over the last couple of years, I've seen that number of hands, sort of the percentage of that increasing slowly. You cannot possibly have good password practices online if you're not using a password manager. 
Unfortunately, it's just not possible because the sophistication of the tools that are working against you have improved so much. Um, what m does actually make a really good password is long and random and unique. Long being at least 20 characters. Um, most of my passwords are 50 unless the site won't let it and then I kind of grump and complain but use whatever their maximum number is. Uh, random, not being like a random phrase from a book that you like but actually randomly generated. And the thing that this does is it forces those scripts to use the least efficient method of breaking your password pos as possible, which is just literally going through every letter, number, symbol combination until they figure it out, which they won't if it's 20 plus characters and it's completely random. And then unique, meaning that you only ever use it in one place. You need a different password for everything that you use. Who uses the same password in at least two places? Yeah, let's be honest, that's not good. Um, and the reason is if for some reason that is gotten in some way, whether it's because of the coffee house Wi-Fi that you were on or because someone was able to, I don't know, be at your computer when you didn't realize they were or whatever it is, you don't ever want, say, the password for your blog to allow those people into your bank account too. Um, <clears throat> keeping those siloed and unique and then keeping them long and random um, is really the absolute best way to handle it. Um, now, there are a lot, there is a lot of security information out there, as I said, and I wanted to cover the things that I hear the most about and the things that I think give a good level base of understanding, but I also wanted to leave an awful lot of time to talk to people about what you are hearing, what you are thinking, and try to smash some more myths, if possible. Um, and so I'm Aaron Campbell. I lead the security team. I'm funded by GoDaddy to do that, which I am very thankful for, and I'd love to take your questions. Yes. Okay, so the question, because I want to make sure it gets repeated on the video, I'm going to try to sum it up, is um, what are we as the WordPress security team doing to help protect against the possibility of someone injecting bad code into either a plugin or theme or possibly even WordPress core and then, and then that being pushed out to your site as an update? Um, first of all, Core is the, the most protected around that, obviously, right? Because we uh, tightly control uh, access to, or who has commit access. We have an even smaller group that is able to actually build releases and a uh, sort of separate group that's able to then um, turn on those automatic updates. And so, um, each of those places along the way is a place that we check uh, before I will build a release for like 4.8.2. I pull up all the, the full code change from the last one to the current one and run through it and verify it. Um, same thing before they turn on auto updates. So core is, is pretty good that way really. Um, plugins, it does become more difficult. But there are still some stop gaps in place. As you, as you said, we did successfully block one recently. Um, for plugins that are already approved in the repository and when um, bad commits come in that are dangerous, those commits are still scanned. 
but they're not necessarily scanned by a human eye. They're scanned by tools that we've built for trying to keep the uh, plugin repository clean and safe. And those catch a huge amount of stuff um, because unfortunately, even plugin developers don't necessarily follow the best password practices. And so sometimes their accounts are compromised or sometimes maybe they are doing it on purpose even, I suppose. Um, but we have automated systems that catch the vast majority of that. Um, those systems are ever evolving. I know that some stuff that was caught recently that had to do with um, coin farming was uh, like our systems have been updated to, to scan for that stuff now. So that's, that's the level of protection that we have in place. Additionally, plugins don't actually force update. They, you have to go in and click to update unless you have some service that, that does it for you. Um, and so Hopefully, we, even if we didn't catch it immediately, we will catch it before some people update. And we do have some um, things in place for remediating that, for taking that code out, and then we can force push an update to undo something that somebody had done that was damaging. Um, but those are the things that we have in place. So the follow-up question was, would I recommend waiting like a week or so to, to update plugins because of this potential risk? Um, and that is going to vary a lot depending on what plugins you're running. Um, for plugins that I trust, the stuff that's from, you know, like the Pippins plugins, the, the Yoast with the SEO, like all these big ones, Jetpack, these kinds, um, no, I would update immediately for the same reasons that I say update, 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 because it helps keep you more secure. Also, in general, um, there, you, updating is probably going to protect you more often than it's going to put you at risk. Um, so I would say no, I would generally update. But I guess if you have some really shaky, questionable plugin, maybe, but I, I don't think so. I think generally speaking, updating is going to protect you more often than not. In the back. I'm sorry, I can, I can barely hear you. Can you speak up a little? So the question is, does limiting um, the number of tries someone gets when they're logging in help secure your site? Um, limiting the number of attempts that they can, uh, can have. And Generally speaking, yes, limiting login attempts is good. Um, it makes sure that these scripts that are even quite sophisticated um, don't get as many tries. Having said that, doing so in an effective way is very difficult because the most common way of doing that is limiting by IP address. Um, and most of these scripts are just set up to then distribute the attack and do only the three or five attempts that you allow, but from 3,000 different IP addresses. Um, so that becomes very difficult very fast from a individual site perspective. The people that are better at doing that are the web hosts that have a much bigger picture of what's going on and can protect further away, and the WAFs or wide area firewalls such as um, uh, Cloudflare, uh, Encapsula, uh, SiteLock, Securi, all these ones that protect you. These are ones that can see these attempts even if they're spread out and still try to protect against them. Yeah. The question was about database prefix, which we did do back here a little bit. Ah, changing the database prefix and busted. And the reason is the, the uh, added sophistication of modern day scripts that are trying to break into sites, they just aren't hard coding the database prefix in anymore. They're discovering it, and so it just it, it doesn't help like it may have three or five years ago. Right here, yes. So on that same area, would you agree with the statement that security by security is not 
Um, so the question is, would I agree that security by obscurity is not security? I would say that security by obscurity is not a good security strategy. Um, can obscurity potentially help? Minimally, at best, uh, it's not a good strategy to have. It doesn't necessarily harm in most situations, but it also doesn't help. Yes? Um, the question is, what do I recommend? Do I have plugins that I use, things like that, for helping secure sites? Um, first of all, it, it's going to be a little bit individual to your site. Some of the stuff that I tried to cover, uh, good password practices and stuff like that, are applicable everywhere, even not on WordPress. Um, but there are things that I use, there are things that I think are helpful kind of across the board. Um, on my own personal site, I run the iTheme security plugin. It's what I like. I think it's very good. Um, I pay for the pro version of it and use that. Uh, two, it offers two-factor authentication, which I didn't get a chance to cover, but is super helpful. It, even though I don't lock down my files, it can monitor them and let me know if there are changes that were unexpected, so that's, that I find useful. Um, depending on the complexity and importance of your site, uh, the wide area of firewalls that I was talking about uh, can be extremely useful because they can block attacks before they ever get to you. They can be a little bit more expensive, so you're paying for that added security, but it is extremely useful. And yes, choosing a good host is obviously very important because if your host gets broken into, uh, then you're pretty bad off. How much more time do I have? A couple minutes? Awesome. I still have a couple minutes, so I'm good. Yeah, right here. Yeah, so I opened the can of worms by talking about multi-factor authentication, and the question is, what kind of multi-factor authentication do I prefer? Um, I like an app. I do not like text message authentication, only because I feel like those can be sometimes delayed, unpredictable, especially if you're traveling abroad, or if you happen to live someplace extremely rural like I do, where sometimes text messages don't come through for quite a while. Uh, I use an app, and most, uh, most common two-factor authentication implementations use a thing called TOTP, um, which is a time-based protocol which generates those tokens, and basically as long as your phone and your server are roughly in sync time-wise, um, that's what I use. I personally use um, the Authy app, but it doesn't really matter what app you use. There's about five or six that are very good. Uh, but that's what I prefer. Yeah, back here. The question is, um, is using a whole separate system like uh, Google to authenticate to your WordPress site, is that the best um, solution to take? Uh, it's, I would say in most cases, no. In your case of a, of a company that's doing this kind of stuff and ha it gives them a little bit more control over authentication, I can understand why they do that. But the downsides of it are that you end up with two things with only one point of, of security, right? So if that is compromised for some reason, then both your email and your WordPress site are both compromised, right? Um, and it's also more complex to keep up and running. Uh, so if you have a staff that's doing that, maybe that's not a part of it, but for the average user, I would say no. But there are obviously always edge cases. Uh, I'm almost out of time, but in this back corner, because I've seen your hand come up several times and missed you.
So the question had to do with XML RPC, which is uh, sort of an API interface that WordPress has available, and uh, attacks coming in through, through that vector, which is a relatively common thing, and it's one of the things that, you know, one of the reasons why, say, hiding your uh, login screen isn't helpful, because there are other ways to get into your site than that. Um, there are things that you can do if you don't use it, like if you're not using mobile apps which use the XML RPC interface or things like that, then you can disable it. Um, there are plugins to do so. The iThemes one that I use actually has some granular controls that let you either completely turn it off or only allow the mobile app to use it, um, some stuff like that. Um, if if you are, like if that's a thing that you're using widely and you need to have it open, then authentication for that is really controlled pretty much by the username and password authentication. So the best that you can do at that point is to make sure that even though they're trying a lot there, they're not succeeding by having a good password. Um, that's all I have time for, um, but I am just going to step right out here and I'm happy to talk to anybody whose questions I didn't get to. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron.